Hello and welcome to Kicking Tires. I'm Jimmy. And I'm Justin. Today, this episode is episode three and is sponsored by Nissan. Or at least... So it may seem. <laughs> the past week, there's been a lot of Nissan news. So we're going to go all over everything about everything that they've talked about. So let's dive right into it. The first things first, Pathfinder. Return. Yeah, brand new model. Finally. It's been a long time since they got a new Pathfinder. I mean, and the old one was not all that exciting. So it, it actually hasn't been around that that long but it, it it was never kind of uh you know well reviewed i would say <laughs> so yeah the the past generation it definitely wasn't that great it was boring it had a cvt well, and they went away from the body on frame and everyone's like oh why you do this but uh let's embrace that i mean i think that's kind of the way I mean, sure. yeah, I mean, everyone's going kind of unibody. I mean, Explore, the, one of the biggest names went unibody. They have, you know, the standard multi-link suspension now rather than a live axle. It's just what everyone is going towards. That's it, the norm. It makes more sense. And the three-row crossover is a really hot segment right now. Yeah, no the one's buying players. fans. <laughs> Yeah, we've got big players like the uh, Hyundai Palisade and the Kia Telluride. That's, those are the two cars that kind of jumped in mind. But obviously, brand new Highlander last year. Well, yep. actually, only for a few months. It's not quite, hasn't quite been a year yet. Uh, and so there, there's a lot of big moves in this segment. And Nissan ultimately needs to catch up. And what do we think about this Pathfinder? So a lot of their... Um their documentation it's about how it returns to the roots of the pre of the first generation pathfinder so it has the three like slots that's up here on the grill mm -hmm. um that's the homage to like the very, original pathfinder yeah um on the back end it says pathfinder that's a cross apparently that's very kind of like reminiscent of the old one as well um i don't personally see anything <laughs> that remotely like I don't, the old one but i think i think the idea is that they went for a more rugged look which you can see with the fender flares uh the mm -hmm. way that rear bumper the silver portion sticks out mm -hmm. that's a lot more aggressive more off-roady and same with the front we have a more kind of butch front end whereas the old one kind of looked more like a centra on steroids this one is uh definitely a boxier more masculine looking front end yeah, and what I like is in the press photos, they have two Pathfinders. They have just like the regular one. I, I would assume that's like the top trim. And they have Platinum. another one that's like kind of an off-roady kind of look. They have like AT tires on it. There's a basket with lights on top. And it looks pretty cool. And uh, it's my favorite color, a green Pathfinder. Oh, it's, I love green cars. Yes. Hope to one, have one one day. Yeah. <laughs> Internal joke is um, Dustin has a Pathfinder, but he does not remember that he has a, or sorry, not Pathfinder. He has a green car that he doesn't remember that he has a green car. It's a Miata that sits in a storage, essentially. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, back to the Pathfinder. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, black roof there, that's a nice touch. We've seen it on other Nissan products for a while now. Um, definitely yeah, that floating it, roof design. Yeah, it gives it gives it a sleeker look. I, I like it. I just uh, I did that on my Rav Four, and I just washed my car for the first time uh, since owning it, uh, and it is hard to wash up there. And I think gloss black. Uh, I, at least it's tall enough that you wouldn't see it because if you saw that after a few years of use, I bet it's disgusting. Because how, how else do you properly wash and maintain that piece? Uh, it's called car wash, Dustin. Oh, but it's gonna get get so swirly. With, yeah, it's how do we like this interior? Um, well, before I go into interior, I want to talk about specs because mm. um, there's some cool stuff here. Um, the Pathfinder is brand new, inside and out, uh, brand new chassis, but same V6, the same three and a half liter V6, 284 horsepower, 259 pound feet of torque. Nothing too special there. Um, but what is special is the transmission. Nissan's always been known for their CVTs, but mm -hmm. this is now a nine-speed supplied by ZF. Nice. So, 
yeah, a return of a regular automatic transmission. I think that does give it a bit more of a heavy duty flair to it. I think Nissan's kind of been controversial to say the least with their uh, CVTs and with these bigger SUVs, one of the things is you're going to be towing with it, uh, maybe, but uh, it, 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 I bet it can tow. Do we have official yeah, 6,000 pounds, 6,000 pounds. So that's almost as much as a Tacoma uh, or, you know, mid-sized truck. So that's really good for this, this segment, you know, it'll be great for road trips and all that stuff. It's a good, family utility vehicle i think that's why they had to go with the zf uh mm. that paired with transmission cooler should tow your small boats and other stuff like that pretty easy um but yeah same vq35 de <laughs> tried and true i guess there's nothing wrong with the engine i think the engine it actually sounds pretty good i remember driving the old pathfinder and i was like oh that's actually a decent engine note. It's just when paired with the CVT, it was just ongoing right. drone. And and I'm sure you're getting better power delivery with the nine speed. Oh, for um, sure. Yeah, so I, I do like this um, <clears throat> overall. Really nice steering wheel, eh? Yeah, all the it's... new Nissan steering wheels, they, they look great. Um, I had it in the Rogue, and I actually really enjoyed the Rogue. I thought... It, mm. It's it's better than the RAV4. It's better than the CRV. It's probably one of the best in the segments. Mm -hmm. It's cheaper than the rest, and it looks great inside and out. And I think for the Pathfinder, it's the exact same. Yeah, it looks way more up upscale than the previous uh, Pathfinder. Look at the all the leather trimming down yeah. the sides, panoramic yeah. sunroof that goes over the first and second row. Uh, new yeah. for this generation Pathfinder, uh, second row captain's cheat, uh, seats. So you can have seven or eight passengers. wonder if there's zero gravity. Yes, the front seats are zero gravity. I don't recall if the second row is. I, zero gravity seats on Nissans has always been great. Like they're so comfortable. Yeah, it's not a gimmick. And I think this really, you know, at least with the Highlander and the uh pilot this is going to give them a run for their money uh, among the japanese brands and i think ultimately there's there's still some hesitation to buy a korean brand i find with some people and yeah nissan's kind of still got that mainstream even though they're a smaller company relatively in terms of market share these days um, i think they're still more of that traditional buyer whereas the um the Palisade or the Telluride, those are people stepping a little bit out of their comfort zone or a little bit more uh, likes to do their research, I would say. Yeah, so like one of my friends, he was looking at a, a family SUV and he really wanted a Palisade. Uh, but then he did a little bit of research and then he looked at all the reports of dealers. Uh, that was the biggest thing for um, the Palisade. And he was like, oh, I don't know if I want to deal with this. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, initial quality, I think there were some hiccups with those two cars. Uh, they tried to brush them out a little bit. There was a shortage for the longest time. People were paying markups for them. Um, ho hopefully, I don't think we'll see that with, with Nissan. Um, but yeah, Palisade, I'm not the biggest fan of it. I think every journalist is oozing over this car. Uh, the Koreans, and I like to see that we're seeing some real competition from from Nissan because Toyota kind of phoned it in on the Highlander. I think they're they're banking on the hybrid technology, which obviously makes that car a winner, and the resale value is going to be insane. So yeah. it's going to be a winner there. So they kind of phoned it in with this newest Highlander. I've I've touched it. I think it's the fit and finish is worse than before somehow. Um, yeah, I'm not that impressed with the new Highlander. I think there's less gimmicks in this, which actually I like. Um, yeah, it's very honest. Yeah, the Highlander has a big, wide touchscreen, um, which if you ever used it, it like the half of it or like 33% of it is actually like as a secondary display. It's kind of useless. It's only the main part, like a good eight inches of it. It's actually useful for your infotainment. And then the climate control that was underneath i didn't wasn't a big fan of it like it was fine mm -hmm. but this is the exact same that is in the rogue and i like how the rogue works it's just simple yeah it's simple it's just like you get into it 
you know exactly how to use it. And that nine inch infotainment that's in the center there, um, there's wireless Apple CarPlay, as well as I believe wired Android Auto, no wireless Android Auto, unfortunately, but still very good display overall. There's a physical volume and tuning knob, which I like. Like, I mean, it may be kind of weird, but like I was just in the Venza and the Venza didn't have that. No it was just, knobs? No, well, the volume knob was a touch button Venza volume knob. So it was oh. it was super hard for me to find. Um, there's, Of course, you have it on the steering wheel, but... There's too many buttons on the Toyota steering wheel, too. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Toyota steering wheel was kind of... It, there was just too much things going on. The buttons are very awkward to reach um, on my RAV4. There's, there's probably 15 buttons, if not more, on there. And they're just... They're not that well spaced out. Uh, this Nissan has a very much more straightforward steering wheel. Um, maybe Let's we can find it again on that. There go. They do also have, yeah, it's just very, you know, this, this does this, you know, volume is up and down, uh, which <laughs> it's kind of taken for granted. And then you have cruise control over here. It's, it's, it's quite logical, I think. And, really nice display behind too with with good graphics that's that's kind of always yeah. been a thing with Nissan. <laughs> their graphics are not that that attractive i think they stepped it up a lot here yeah unfortunately this is not made by a poly polyphonic Polypho- oh like the gtr the, the the gtr that made uh gran turismo yeah <laughs> it's not made by them but it's uh it looks good because it's the same display that was in the rogue um, the digital display, it doesn't show like a huge amount of information, but what it does show is enough. And I actually really enjoyed it. Yeah. I don't know if you can zoom in. There's a picture of the drive mode selector on this thing. It's quite intense. It's, it reminds me of some of the Ford or Land Rover products. There's a lot of different modes on this guy. There is. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like there's some kind of mud, sand, uh, winter, winter. Trailer, a racing flag. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot of modes on this thing, uh, and that knob even looks just like what's in the Ford or Land Rover products. Yeah, um, it. I mean, honestly speaking, you're probably just going to leave it on auto and just leave it at that. I'm yeah. sure it changes how the uh, how the all wheel drive system control. works and traction control works. But for most people, you just leave it on auto and you just mash the throttle and you hope to get out, and that's really. You know, right. that's well, really now that they've gone with a nine speed, I wonder if that will change kind of the transmission shift logic. As yeah, well. it's definitely possible. That's a that's a good looking shifter too. I wonder how easy it is to use. Um, it wasn't bad in the Rogue, but what I did find was it was a little wobbly. Um, um it just it just shook a little from side to side a little bit more than what I would like. It shifted fine. It was actually super easy to use. There's a button on the side that you click on. And then you can just pull down to shift into drive, push up to shift into reverse, very logically. But it it just had a little too much play in it for mm. what I like. Yeah, those are things you can't really tell from pictures, but mm. uh, it likely carries through throughout the range. Mm. Um, but yeah, the green color is amazing. Yeah, I, I'm excited for this car. I think I think the engine being an older engine is fine because look at the rest of the segment. They yeah. haven't really pushed the segment as far as drivetrains. I think the Explorer might have kind of something there, but uh, yeah. Well, the Explorer has a uh, twin turbo six, right? So yeah, it has the power on the ST, and they have a hybrid. I, right. I think what Nissan needs, I said this in the Rogue review, is they just need hybrid technology. Hybrid. <laughs> um, I think if they had a good hybrid with the Pathfinder. Highlander just take a lot of Highlander sales. Absolutely, sure. just, there wouldn't be a logical choice to go with the Highlander. Yeah, but the Highlander is so proven, and that's kind of always been Toyota's thing: is don't innovate, just kind of evolve just <laughs> enough that maybe your old <laughs> get into Hope, it. But. Hopefully, people won't notice too much that is exactly the same as last year. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I mean. It's a good looking truck or car or SUV. I like the V Motion grill. Yeah. I like the LED headlights that it has. The, Everything works. Yeah. It, Super cohesive design. Yeah. It's a good looking truck. I, I can't wait uh, for this to come out. And it should come out sometime this year, um, mid this year. I think these are saying summer. I was talking summer, to the PR yeah. rep 
Um, and she told me that it's uh, summer this year is when we should be able to get our hands on it. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's really all I got for the Pathfinder. Yeah. Moving on from that, onto more Nissan news, their Frontier, or what some people are calling the new Tacoma. <laughs> this might be uh, a genuine replacement for a lot of people looking to buy a Tacoma because you know the Frontier have actually got a really heavily revised engine last year. Yeah, <laughs> just the engine. <laughs> just the engine, uh, which I don't think that really changed much. If you're going to buy a Frontier, you're going to buy a Frontier. Yeah. If you weren't, you just weren't because <laughs> that body style was so old. 15 years 15 maybe i think 15 15 years years since they got an update yeah yeah 16 yeah 15 or 16 years um and i think the exterior i didn't mind the exterior of the frontier i think it looked fine it was really the interior and the um all the toys that you normally get in newer Mm -hmm. cars you just don't get on that frontier but for this well i was gonna say completely new truck but it's not it's the same frame underneath. There's not that much that changes with frame technology, but I, I guess. Exactly. I don't think that's going to be a problem. It's like not. in terms of sizing, in terms of what it can do. I think it's perfect. There's no need to create a brand new frame. If the old frame works, the only thing I would think here that may become a small problem for some is just the amount of space in the back seats. Because in the current Frontier, I mean, if it's the same frame, I'm thinking same cab size, the rear seats was pretty tight back there. I mean, the Frontier and the Tacoma, they're all like tight back seats. It was really the Gladiator gladiator and the Ridgeline that has the enormous back seats. But it is still a midsize truck. It's not a full size, right? I think this segment, you're not taking your whole family out. It's not that type of truck. But it's a very good looking truck, I think. Yeah, the the elements are super aggressive. Uh, it's just so, so interesting to look at. There isn't really a bad angle for this truck. Yeah, what we're looking right now, this is the Pro 4X model, which is like their off-road version. Uh, we can kind of think of it as like the TRD off-road. Maybe not like the full TRD package, but... TRD I mean, off-road. they even put it in the TRD cement gray. They, <laughs> they know who they're they're gunning after here. Uh, Pro 4X. Interesting thing with the Pro 4X, I read that the, is it the king cab or the crew cab that's the smaller one? The crew cab must be the smaller one. The king. No, no, king cab is a smaller one. King cab is okay, the Okay, that makes no sense. Cab. <laughs> But the, uh, the 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 shorter cab is available in the Pro 4X in Canada. It will not be in the US, which kind of sounds weird, but I guess no one wants the shorter cab. Most people are going to be buying the crew anyways. It's uh, only if you want the longer bed. But I think, wait, doesn't the longer bed come with the longer cab anyways? I don't believe so. I think there's only one frame mm. configuration. So you can you either choose, and that's kind of been the way for this whole segment, except for the Tacoma. That's kind of they kind of have that going for them uh with the Tacoma. Let's see, let's see with the uh current one. But uh just to stall a little bit while Jimmy finds some news on the <laughs> old frontier, I guess. Um yeah, we've got that 3.8 liter V6, which I think. Would have been nice to see that in the Pathfinder. 3.8 V6, 310 horsepower. It's the most power in its segment. Um, that's more than the even the Ranger, which is just over 300, I believe, with the little turbo. And uh, Tacoma's down at like 276 or something like that. Um, Gladiator's obviously got all different configurations. I don't think the Gladiator's really cross-shopped that as much because it's just the pricing and the the specs are just so different from this. This is more of your utility truck uh, in the frontier, more along the lines of the Colorado or the Tacoma, which start, well, realistically, you could get an okay spec for under 40. Um, The frontier is off Nissan's website, so I can't tell you. (laughs) <laughs> I, I feel I, like I there was only it. one wheelbase for this uh for this chassis yeah oh i think yeah nissan 
not nissan.com yeah it's someone must some have guy's taken. website yeah, yeah. um <laughs> let's see if it's here oh it is okay perfect nissan usa to the rescue so let's see build and price let's see if there's a oh okay. in let's see okay so we got crew cab oh, there is a long bed. wheelbase there is a long bed but I think yeah. the Pro 4X, you can't get it in a long bed. I that's, think that's what, what it was. was. Yeah, I'm looking at the press release right now for the 2022, and there is a crew cab long wheelbase option with a six-foot bed. Hmm. So uh, I think, but, you know, the shorter cab with the long bed, I think there is uh, actually a really big market for it. You know, one thing that I noticed this week, especially, uh, it's kind of become a meme on TikTok, if any of our listeners are on TikTok, but the Ford Ranger, not the current Ford Ranger, but the previous one with the jump seats in the back, those are still everywhere. I, I, don't, I don't know if it's because I, I've been watching these TikToks, but I can't go two blocks without seeing one. And that, that was such a popular truck because it was cheap, had a super useful bed, actually had decent towing capacity, I think about 5,000 pounds with the V6. And so that, I think this kind of truck is there is a market for it. I think the Tacoma has kind of become, it's kind of infamously become the truck with no utility. It doesn't tow all that well, not that much payload. The cabin is kind of cramped, but people still want it. Yeah. But uh, the, the Ranger back in the day in the mid 2000s was quite the seller. And I think uh, having that crew cat or King cab I don't know why the king is is lower than the crew. <laughs> Does it make sense? <laughs> slight, slight marketing malfunction there. Yeah. It's fine. I never really looked into uh, N- Nissan trucks, but I mean, I think th- this car speaks for itself. It's just so good looking and uh, it's just so compelling. And I wanted the Gladiator, but I think the pricing just doesn't make no. sense for that truck. The- I had a chance to drive a, a Gladiator, and the Gladiator the that I had, it was the Mojave. Mojave, with all the options. Um, it was yeah. almost eighty thousand Canadian dollars, eighty eighty k. It's all. It's all. I remember it was almost double that of like the base Gladiator, and it, because it's a Mojave, you can only get it with the Pentastar. You can't even get any other engine options with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's a lot of money, but let's people uh, are still buying it. Let's look at the interior of the Frontier. I think this is where they didn't go quite as hard as they could have. <laughs> I think they left it a little bit more rugged. So I, I think the, rugged. I, I feel like you know they still left like a lot of the bigger knobs and stuff that's in here. So yeah. a lot of the stuff is actually lifted from the Titan. So like the steering wheel is right. from the Titan. Yeah, it's an the older gen display. Yeah, all that is from the Titan rather than from the Pathfinder, for example, or the Rogue, because yeah. all this is actually kind of old school tech. Yeah, I mean, even the vents, they're just so uninspired. They're, they're literally what you yeah. would find from a Nissan product in the early 2000s. So we haven't pushed it that far. Those are nice touches. I think you're only getting them on the Pro 4X with those uh, orange accents. Orange grab handles, yeah. Yeah, you're not getting them on those base model trims. And I think it will just feel a little bit too basic for this segment. Uh, you I, know, the Colorado is not fancy. Colorado is is horrible. It has a horrible interior. Yeah, especially if you get a base <laughs> model, it's it's not good. But the Colorado has also been around for a while. Right. Uh, the Tacoma's Rangers interior not, isn't much better. I, I I don't know. I might disagree on that. I think the Ranger, you got some soft touch plastics. It's got a curvier look, a bit more like a Ford Focus. Um it is a little bit older because the Ranger again is, even though it's new for North America, it's um, it's old. You know, just having those silver accents around the fan vents, it just it's a more pleasant shape. I think it's a little bit curvier. I I do like that what they've done with that interior, at least for the segment. You know, it's it's no Gladiator. Um, I think it's at least on par with the Tacoma. It feels more complete. Like I drove that car. I liked the interior. I didn't really like the way it drove, um, unfortunately. But the Tacoma really is also just drawn with a ruler, and it's all cheap plastic. There's, there's not. It reminds much- me of the Prius, the Prius C. 
Yeah, yeah, uh, of 10 years prior, but yes, <laughs> again, um, Tacoma, you know, you could put anything on the interior. You could make it with any crappy material and people would still buy it. Um, they, they got away with it for a while and then they finally added height adjustable seats. Like, I, I think the Tacoma, I think it's, it's, it stands for something I don't really like in the car industry. We were saying that earlier with the Highlanders, just the lack of innovation, the, the phoning it in that Toyota really does on the, those, those vehicles because they know they'll sell regardless. I think the Frontier interior kind of let me down a little bit. It's a nice screen, nice infotainment, but, um, you know, this, if this needs to stick around, let's put it, if it needs to stick around for another 16 years, this is not going to survive. <laughs> no, it's not. That's yeah, you're absolutely right. But it's, it's a, it's a very good step up from the previous frontier. It's much needed. Step yeah, up. yeah. It's frontier. Like it's oh, oh, <laughs> this is, like this one. Yeah. It's, it was it was really bad. This it's is 2002. A huge step up from previous, and while yes is not the best, I think the amount of work that they did here is enough for now. Yeah. Um, but I also think like because a lot of this interior is kind of tested in the Titan, it's going to stand up. Yeah, and I mean the thing is, we know that. Nissan can make a nice interior with their other products. That's kind of where I feel let down a little bit with this car. Um, how do we, let's see. I mean, the Nissan, the international one is what, the Navara? Yeah. I think that has a better interior than this, though. Let's see if I know how to spell it. Navara? I think it's one R. Or, you know, that's just a more pleasant car-like interior. But this is, is this is basically the old Sentra or the old Altima interior, though. Yeah, but it's just a little bit softer to look at. Um, yeah, I don't know. I I don't think this is this, I, this isn't a truck interior. No, I don't sure. think this is any better than what this is. Um, so, like, I don't think the Navara is any better. Than it's the not. 2021. But I wonder frontier. if uh, if this Frontier interior is the same worldwide or uh, or just North America or just North America is with the chunky knobs and everything. Well, this is the 2021 Navara. Oh, well, there you go. That is that's a Titan. <laughs> that's a Titan. That actually is a Titan. That's not a Navara. <laughs> So yeah. with the Frontier, we're seeing up to 6,700 towing uh, capacity. That's with the rear-wheel drive model. So realistically, we're down about 62, I think, with all-wheel drive or four-wheel drive, sorry, um, which is kind of normal for the segment. But look at the Pathfinder. We're seeing 6,000 pounds on that. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure this will, this will handle the 6,000 pounds better than the Pathfinder, though. I'm guessing, yeah, it probably is better cooling and stuff like that. Yeah. But... Payload's not bad, 1610. Um, I was looking at the numbers between the uh, Tacoma versus the Frontier. Basically the same. Um, mm -hmm. It's basically the same size in terms of like length, height, width, towing, um, interior, or sorry, towing as well as uh, maximum payload. It's basically the same between the mm -hmm. two trucks. So, like, it really goes to show, like, when Nissan was developing this, there's only one one truck that they're they really benchmarked the Tacoma. And, I mean, the, look at the domestics. They're usually a little bit higher in terms of payload mm -hmm. and their towing. Um, I think that is kind of important to mention because the like, Colorado has been around for a while. It's still it's still quite the workhorse. And, I mean, they, they start at, at very low M base MSRP. Yeah, and you can get a diesel in them, which is nice. Yeah, I think the Colorado is no slouch, I think, in this segment. You know, we here in Vancouver, the Tacoma obviously reigns supreme, but I think the Colorado overall North American numbers are not half bad. And yeah, the up to 7,700 pounds of towing capacity on the Colorado. That's kind of what we were seeing from full-size 
pickup trucks mm-hmm. not too long ago and maybe even with some of the japanese full size who are around <laughs> there too yeah i mean i i personally think like while no it's not groundbreaking on the frontier mm-hmm. um i still can't wait to to take one out because like it's just been so long it's just refreshing of to course see something new yeah i mean even from this angle it just looks like a tacoma like yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, the rear it's three got quarter, yeah. elements from other trucks i mean there's only so much you can do to style a truck it's the box fenders box. <laughs> the boxy fenders are nice though like that's a really nice touch mm-hmm. uh with the flares flare on flare action there uh it's got that little dip in the driver or front window kind of like the uh ford truck f-150 yeah <laughs> yeah um and yeah it has a bit of a concept car look to it but it's it's this is reality and concept car exterior with a very slight, slightly dated out of the box interior slightly dated but i think it's susceptible i was actually looking at titans um just curious because i want to get a pickup because i want to go off-roading i want to do an overland <laughs> build anyways i was looking at titans and i was like you know what? That interior isn't bad. Looking That's at the a, current gen interior. Yeah, I think the like, Titan is totally, totally reasonable. Um, I don't know how they, they do in terms of resale and stuff like that. It's not great. That's why picking one up used is amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's probably the least sought after of the full-size truck. It is No, it's definitely the least sought after. That or after... the Tundra. The Tundra, so Tundra has that million mile reputation mm. that will always kind of move them along. Yeah. Um, Tundra, if anything, is more durable than a uh, Tacoma. But yeah, <laughs> that that's one truck that's really due for a refresh. Yeah, um, I think uh, I think they said they will twenty twenty two. I think that's where the rumors are at right now. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I don't have much high hopes for the Tundra. I think it's always been trailing behind the domestics. I mean, both Ford and Ram is just pushed forward quite a bit. And uh, the, the Tundra is just not there. No, definitely not. Yeah. Well, let's move on to another Nissan product, the Kicks. This is the one in our pre-show discussion that we're kind of the most excited about, which makes no sense because this is just a facelift. <laughs> it's a facelift of the of, of, of a redesigned Versa, uh, Versa hatchback. It's exactly a Versa underneath. So same wheelbase, same engine, same, like everything is the same. It's just taller. Yeah. yeah. And it makes a lot of sense, I think, for people having that taller cab. Uh, not only you get a little bit more room for that, but uh, it is a better look and more kind of with the times. I think the old Versa was one of the ugliest hatchbacks you could get. Uh, the new sedan so, is not bad. I, I think all the new Nissans, they have a really good look to them. Yeah, this one, let's do a side-by-side with the outgoing kicks because that's not a... Uh, I, I don't want to say it's not a pretty car, but yeah... That's not a pretty car. <laughs> no, it's kind of a the the V motion wasn't big enough, so it was kind of pig nose. Yeah, they slapped it on there. They kind of yeah. The new one definitely it's better. I, I'm still not in love with the front end. I think the rear is where I like it the most. Yeah. Um, especially in this SR trim that's like dual tone blue and black. Mm-hmm. Um, and all the, all the press photos that they have, they just make it look really nice and really. Yeah. One thing the press release was not. 100% clear on is whether the LED he- headlights and taillights make it across the range or if it's only on the higher trims. Mm-hmm. Um, but the nice thing about their trim levels is your bottom tier trim is about just a little over 20. The top of the line is just about over 25. It's not a big range for four different trim levels. Um, so you can go full load for 25, which I think is not a bad value for what you get. You're getting really yeah. nice uh, bow system and uh, yeah, it has the has speakers in the headrest itself. Or, yeah, it has the um, yeah 360 camera and looks it looks really slick in this SR. There's two SR trims now. There's the SR and then the SR Premium was it? 
forget. Maybe SR SR premium. premium yeah, SR premium. So there's the SR premium is going to be twenty four nine ninety eight before destination in Canada. Um, that is, I think that's a great value because, you know, with this segment, this is one of the oddest segments. This is one of the things that we we haven't. It's not well defined. Like what competes with what because. You know, you kind of think, okay, that looks similar to a CHR in size. CHR is a little bit bigger, um, but the thing—it's a lot more money. It's a lot more money, exactly. And even I was like, okay, well, maybe the uh, little Trailblazer—that's a lot more money too. Yeah. Uh, and I'm like, that doesn't make much sense to me. This this is the perfect amount of car for a new driver. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's the right size. You'll seat for reasonably comfortably. Oh, the back seat uh, is it's it's enormous. Like you can yeah. definitely have a, adults in the back with no problems. Yeah. The only thing it's missing is the all wheel drive option. That one you will have to go up to the Cashkai, Cashkai or yeah. Rogue Sport to get, um, and that that moves it the price up about four four to five grand. Which in this segment. You know, four to five grand doesn't sound like that much, but it is twenty. It's a significant the, percentage, yeah. It is, yeah. Your payments are going up twenty percent a month, or what have you. So, uh, really nice interior. I think, I think this interior, it's it's conventional, but it's 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 premium in a sense. Like it's yeah. You get the the stitched dash. You get a good um, like display. It looks like a an eight inch display that's on there yeah good I'm looking sure steering Apple wheel and android flat bottom steering wheel on a, on a <laughs> kicks that's your typical nissan old steering wheel not the new one it's still good i think it's, it's still fine. nice it's nicer than what's on the uh frontier that we just saw <laughs> yeah. yeah the truck wheel um there is a digital screen um as an instrument cluster that's the same one that's used in the versa as well as the mm. leaf yeah, you know what my pet peeve on that picture is? Is the start button. Oh, you don't like it beside the shifter? No, I don't like that at all. But I'm, I don't think there's another picture on the other side, but I'm almost certain that there's a blank on the side of the steering wheel. Yeah, they there's always a, do that because the, the lower trims won't have it. And then, Yeah, I can see it right here. There's a blank. <laughs> oh, there we go. But, I mean, let's talk about what kind of standard features you get for 20 grand because I think that is – an amazing number in 2021 to have this much value. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're getting, where did I put this here? Well, obviously the automatic. So they only come in an automatic, whereas some cars in this segment, I think the, the, the was venue. it the venue, yeah. the venue is available in the uh, manual trim. Yeah. The venue, I think is the only real competitor to the kicks. Mm-hmm. Um, same price point, same kind of, like design overall because the versa or sorry the cakes came from the versa and the venue came from the accent um so the base of it is exact same subcompact hatchbacks now that are lifted to compete in the suv world but right it makes sense like my parents um they currently have a 2010 rdx and every single time i get into an suv they love it because they're like oh it's great i can get in and out easier but see like, out of it yeah um i was in the mercedes a35 which is my background here um and i took them out for a spin and they didn't like it they're like oh it just sits it feels cold. cramped and the window is high you don't get those big greenhouse um yeah yeah they, they love the gla i mean the interior of the gla and the a class is the exact same yeah but just getting in and out of a higher riding vehicle it is quite a bit easier for someone of age so it makes complete sense why the kicks exist i mean everyone out there right now is saying oh i hate suvs bring back wagons bring back hatchbacks yeah but you know what they're not buying that people aren't buying hatchbacks and wagons and and you know what doesn't make sense is that you know, the case for a hatchback over a crossover is, oh, it handles better. How well do you think a Versa handled? Like, <laughs> where, <laughs> what have you been driving that you, you think a Versa is, like, compelling to drive car? It never was and never will be. And this might be a fraction of a percentage worse to drive than a Versa, but who cares? Not it's, the people that are buying them. No, not at all. The people that are buying this want something that's easy to see out of, 
want something that's easy to park, that's something that's economical. Mm -hmm. And it checks all the all those boxes. Yeah, it's just this car has a premium look to it, I think. I think they because they've trickled down the design language from other Nissan models, it it really makes this one look good. And uh yeah, standard CarPlay, Android Auto is kind of typical, but Safety Shield 360 is standard as well. Um mm -hmm. have you tested too many cars with that? Um so the Safety Shield 360 is like they're more normal stuff so like it's non non -pro radar pilot. guided cruise yeah. it's like the four collision warning um it's i believe it has the blind spot monitoring um so mm -hmm. rather than like the actual like full lane keep assist and radar guided cruise yeah. um i mean it's i mean other than me trying to crash into a wall there's no real way to test that uh <laughs> yeah and i but i mean those features are nice to have it gives you a bit of an insurance discount speaking yeah. of insurance you know we saw the iihs uh, mm -hmm. for the 2020 kicks really good crash mm -hmm. test ratings all around the only thing they lost points on was the headlights which if they're doing an led i'm sure that that, that bumps them up a step and uh so it's a great very safe car very affordable car what's not to love not like well i mean if because you want look something at with the, a little uh, bit more power than maybe that but that's uh, <laughs> the outgoing versa is so hideous uh, it has 122 horsepower and 114 pound feet of torque it's yeah it's quite little but i think because of how light it is it's not that bad because i remember driving the verse the uh kicks before and yes you you put your foot down and really nothing happens but it's fine and it's such like it gives so, like the fuel economy so good mm -hmm. 7.7 7 in the city 6.6 6 on the highway yeah for a super practical you don't need a hybrid system you don't need that extra um like technology and the the extra amount of money used on the hybrid tech on a car to get really good fuel economy exactly yeah and yeah this whole segment that's kind of speaks for the segment, I think, with the small subcompact. I, I don't even know what's considered a small or, <laughs> or subcompact or compact anymore. Because a RAV4 to me is still a it, it's technically a compact. To me, it's a compact, but actually um, I think it then, was I saw on I think it was Auto Trader recently. They were yeah. saying the best mid size small mid size or something like that. Yeah, and it was like the RAV4. I was like, is that really a mid size? Now SUV? we have sub sub segments, but it is a lot bigger than than this. Yeah. So oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's, well, it's a little bit confusing. Yeah. It it definitely is. Uh, but to add on to the confusion, the cash guy is getting an upgrade as well. The cash guy was always a confusing one because it had the rogues front end, but it was just chopped off from it wasn't as back big as a rogue yeah. foot. Yeah, but that was that always did it favors because the interior just felt like one step up because it is from one segment up. Yeah. <laughs> um but I don't think for this one it's gonna be that way because a lot of this is taken from the rogue. Like we can see. Um, a little bit of this preview and this dash that's the exact same one that's in the rogue which mm -hmm. is in the exact same one that's in the pathfinder right. and in the middle of the dash we can kind of see what the car looks like and it looks quite good actually really like it i'm excited yeah, it's it's a it's a predictable look let's see the interior touch like these interior details look great i think it again it it, it you know compared to what honda and uh and toyota have this is this is uh definitely a lot nicer mm -hmm. and can, can uh, we talk about what i'm showing right now yeah massage seats on a subcompact you no never get that you don't even get that on a mercedes the gl8 yeah. nope you, you don't get that on the GLA. You don't get it on the X1. You don't get that on the X3. Like, <laughs> like, but I, I really don't think it's an actual massaging seat. I think it's a, a vibrate. Uh, uh, maybe it'll uh, vibrate vibration a little device. bit or something. <laughs> I, I really don't think it's going to be much, but it's I think it's going to be something that's cool and just a unique feature that the cash guy would have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're really, really stepping it up across the range. I mean, 
obviously a lot of what you saw with the rogue is going to trickle down to this and the rogue is a winner as we've seen on jimmy mac reviews and uh i think the cash kai and the kicks are really solid competitors in their respective fields i honestly think like last year um when mazza came up with the three i was like mazza is the next up and coming brand they mm-hmm. have amazing products for 2021 it's nissan it's all nissan it is and Rogue, this is the comeback yeah you know mazda we saw coming they've been kind of stepping everything up slowly slowly yeah ever since, since the launch of the 14 20 even since 2014 15 they they already move way ahead of like the mazda 3 then is way nicer than the corolla or mm-hmm. uh or the civic at the time and uh but yeah, Nissan, really underdog, really unpredictable. Because uh, I, you know, I think if you asked me a year ago, I thought they were going bankrupt. I thought they were going bankrupt. I thought they were gone. I thought they were dead. Yeah, they had <laughs> so little R and D in their whole lineup, and suddenly they shock us with kind of at least five or six really solid models. Yeah, the Ultima That's- was really good when that was launched. Yeah. Um, it kind of faded because in Canada we don't get the VC turbo that the US does. That whole um, segment so has faded though. It, the Accord true. was decent again, but even the Accord is not really a, a volume seller these yes. days. Well, CRV outsells a Accord by a bunch. Yeah. The Sentra is good. I really enjoyed my time with the Sentra. The materials in the Sentra was great. Um, the Rogue is amazing. I had a chance to drive the Titan which was just like a small refresh. And I like that quite a bit as well. Every single Nissan product that I've sat in, it, it was surprising to me how much better it was. It's such a good value. And I think they're going after the Koreans. Like they're going after the Koreans by representing themselves as a Japanese brand. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's a decent move for them because ultimately people want to buy a nissan they they, they've had them in their families before i think Uh, they're not scared of it there's a good dealer network the brand itself means more than the korean brands yes and i want to tell you a very funny story of when i went to look at the leaf because i went to look at the leaf before i got the rav4 hybrid and uh the sales manager was like (laughs) He told me one of the funniest things I've ever heard come out of someone's mouth, which was, we're in the top five Japanese brands. And then I started counting in my head. I'm like, there's only five of you. <laughs> so there's your last Honda, place. <laughs> Toyota, Nissan, and then Mazda, Subaru. Mazda, Subaru, Mitsubishi, Suzuki. Okay, they made no, Suzuki's not in Canada anymore. Yeah, so but they're alive elsewhere. There's you, can buy, you can buy a Hayabusa. There's a new Hayabusa coming, but that's <laughs> kind of irrelevant to Ali. <laughs> kind of as far away. As, but he was referring to in North America, and I'm like, that makes you pretty bottom of the barrel for a Japanese brand. But that's still, in some people's mind, that still puts you ahead of others, like a domestic brand or yeah, um, brand. Um, and I think, yeah, ultimately you match that with the, uh, you know, if you had good financing, good lease, I think there is, we're really due for a comeback with Nissan, uh, legitimate competitors. Yeah. I, I can't wait. You know what I want from Nissan though? I want the Quest. I want the Quest yeah. back. Like, I know people are, oh, no one's going to buy uh, vans. It's all SUVs. You're You're not wrong. People always gravitate towards SUVs because they're just cooler to see and, you know, and whatnot. But like, as a father now, I respect the need of a van. Doors. <laughs> it's, Sliding doors are so good. It's easier. It's yeah. just easier. If they bring back the Quest with a lot of this information that they have now attained, yeah. think Pathfinder, but lower sliding doors. It's going to be, well, as good, if not better, than the Odyssey and the Sienna and the Pacifica and the Kia Sedona. Because that's it. There's only four vans available. 
Yeah, and I mean, they've always been so funky with that quest. I think it's always been a <laughs> compelling product. And uh, funky is a good way to put it. It's it's a it's a cool 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 van. Um, uh, they haven't updated the Elgrand much. So. Yeah, the the last generation was a very big flop in North America. Show it with an Elgrand front end, though. Yeah, well, the, well we can't get Nissan that Quest here. with no, no no Nissan Quest with the Elgrand front end. Quest with Elgrand front. It looks amazing. <laughs> That's local too. <laughs> yeah, that is <laughs> the white one. Is is a uh, is a local. yeah. Uh, I think his name is Felix. Yeah, yeah. Stan's brother. <laughs> <laughs> I love. I I really like this van. Uh, it won't it won't sell again. This type of van. It's not what North American van market is for. Uh, this is a little too boxy. A little too tall riding. A little just too commercially um, in terms of kind of what it was. But the previous generation quest, so second gen, that one actually had, oh, maybe the third gen. Is it third gen? Yeah. No, that's that's the, the one. first. Yeah. So this one, um, the one that was when the Ultima uh, was had a full refresh on that Murano, new platform. Yeah. And everyone was like every they Nissan VQ product everything. had a VQ engine. Yeah. yeah. This quest was great. It had great seating services, and this quest had the second row fold down seats. Folding seats. The second row folding seats of that quest was amazing. It folded right to the floor because of how it was designed. The seats themselves were super thin, so they weren't comfortable. <laughs> but the fact that they can fold into the floor was very cool. And this is, I think that was before. Um, the caravan had the uh, stolen go for about yeah, the same caravan. Time. I think had it maybe 08, no, maybe a little bit before they had it on that that uh, that previous generation, not the one that they still make today, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can't find the picture, but that's okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's just what I would personally want being a father, um, but it's like segments it's, dying off and it, you can tell because <laughs> because uh the koreans haven't invested that much into it not at all and uh well actually odyssey there is a new there is a new sedona coming yeah the carnival <laughs> yeah it looks <laughs> it looks pretty good looks amazing looks pretty good you can totally see this in like a korean drama and it's got that <laughs> floating roof design uh, there's the curtain especially with the curtains like you could totally see there's one the that they make as a high roof so that way you actually have headroom inside because it's part of the limo package yeah but kia went and updated their whole lineup and just kind of left this the sedona behind a little bit yeah the Maybe. sedona that we get in north america is is mo well, this one here it's just black it just doesn't feel um this doesn't feel kind of in line with if you walk into a Kia dealership and you're like, oh, this is this is all futuristic and everything. And then you get into Sedona and it's kind of feels the same as it did five or six years ago. Yeah, it's definitely um, the previous gen. Kind of when you bought your Optima, that that generation. Yeah, 2010, yeah. Yeah. So it, it does feel a step back. Uh, and you know, even the Odyssey is not not that great, I feel. Brand new well, the- Sienna though. The new Sienna, they it's the it's a hybrid as the hybrid van that everyone's been kind of asking for. The Pacifica, of course, is a plug-in hybrid, but the pricing on the Pacifica is quite high. Um, Sienna yeah. actually undercuts it by a little bit, and all Sienna is uh, it's plug. Or sorry, is all the Siennas are hybrid now, and you can get an all-wheel drive option. And it's the same all-wheel drive that's in your Rav Four. Like it's a motor in the back. There's mm-hmm. no, drive, no shaft, drive shaft, nothing like that. And it makes sense. I mean, on a van, you have a completely flat bottom. No drive shaft makes it a whole lot easier to make it all-wheel drive. Super practical and better on gas because this whole segment has been so bad on gas, Toyota included. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and yeah, the new Sienna, that that is going to be the car if you want a minivan. That's the only real viable option it will destroy everything in terms of resale fuel economy and just looks 
looks the part. I, th mm -hmm. I think the XSC, the one that I have currently on the screen, is the best looking minivan that you oh, currently yeah. can get. It's amazing. And that whole swagger wagon that they had going on, I think like it's still a thing. Yeah, absolutely a thing. It it looks great. It really does. Um, yeah. I have one booked at the end of February, so I get to we'll know more guess. about that soon. Yeah, and yeah. I've seen I've seen a few on the road here in Richmond, and. Uh, it's, it's it's a good looking car it's got a striking rear end the odyssey looks the same as it has for 15 years like <laughs> honestly like that 2021 that gray one the rear if you drive behind that you i couldn't that and a 06 is hard to distinguish from a distance that is so dated and just no effort at all i mean i'm in love with this odyssey Everyone loves the JDM Odyssey. The 2003 Japanese market Odyssey, the Odyssey Absolute. Um, we can get them here in Canada now. I've saw some on Craigslist mm. for about $6,000. So maybe it's time for me to pick one. Maybe of those. that's what you need. But that doesn't have <laughs> sliding doors. It's, it's fine. It looks cool. So it's fine. <laughs> It'll pass. Well, it's narrower. So yeah. you don't need the sliding doors as bad. As you as some of the bigger yeah North American, but I I I can't live with a right hand drive day to day. True. I need I need to go to McDonald's, and when I go to McDonald's, if I'm right hand drive, you have to go I, in reverse. I, I'm not reversing. <laughs> I did that. I did that once in a Skyline. The person at Wendy's was very upset with me. It's like, why are you reversing? I was like, oh, because I'm on the other side of the car. It's like, oh, get on the right side then. I'm like. I am on the right side of the car. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, minivans aside, we have all the crossovers. I think Nissan's got got a really decent product coming up, and uh, if the new Fairlady Z is mm. uh, is a compelling product, then yeah, that's. That's all your base is covered pretty much aside from the pickup trucks. Well, the full size truck. Yeah. I think I think in terms of full size truck, it's still and full hard. size SUV. Yes, but it will be they're a long way from that. Uh the new GMs, I love them. Like the new Yukon or the new Escalade, they're so nice. They are. They they definitely reach a much further step. Um, the current expectation, like I, I'm not a big fan of the interior because it's just mm -hmm. F-150. Um, but like the Armada, just it doesn't look the part. Like I mean, this, it's literally the same. It's uh, it's a patrol, and it's been that way for a very long generation. Oh, this is a new one. Sorry. Um, so upgraded headlights and grill and everything, but it's just it looks like the Pathfinder. But yeah. it's not as nice as the Pathfinder inside, and no, it's 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 cars like this that will make people move to that body on not away from the body on frame and to the uni body because the that segment with the Highlanders and the Palisade and the Pathfinder they've they've gone and made them so nice inside, yeah. and this <clears throat> Armada and it's just, just about the same as interior volume has yeah you're not floor. losing anything the floor is just higher in these yeah. so you really lose out in terms of practicality yeah they're terrible on gas yeah actually it's not horrible i drove one from portland oregon back home to vancouver here um in a qx80 so the infinity version the of narwhal this. as i like to call it <laughs> i i average just at 11 liters for 100 kilometers on the highway trip back it's bad i mean yes i know it's bad i mean it's 11 on the highway but it, it, i i expected worse oh sorry <laughs> it's not a narwhal it's a manatee that's what i'm thinking of. just google a picture of mandy and you know what a, a qx80 looks like <laughs> why <laughs> They they fixed it with this front end. The the one the, the blue one in the middle, the 2015 right there. That one is so <clears throat> yeah, because it has that bulging head of a hood forehead thing. Yeah, yeah, not a good look for it. Yeah. But yeah, you know what size. does look nice? What does what does look nice is the Audi e-tron. Our the next Audi take in. <laughs> That's literally what it is. It it is an Audi Taycan. Um, because 
that's exactly what it is. Um, I mean, of course, as you guys know, uh, Audi and Volkswagen Group, Porsche Group, Lamborghini, um, Bentley Group, Skoda, Seat, it's all the same group. And when it's the same group, you share a lot of, well, production together. This underneath is a Taycan 4S. It's exactly the same. But this is cheaper. And I think looks better. It's a more aggressive front end, but I think it's way too much grill for an EV. Like it just, it doesn't make sense to put that much grill on an electric car that doesn't need it. Let's find a good picture of that front end here. It is a more sporty, more aggressive looking car front and back. The The Porsche product is a little bit softer. Um, the Porsche product looks like a Beluga. You know, it, it does. I do like it, though. <laughs> but you don't like, like, was it? The, uh, the, the, the QX80? Yeah. <laughs> How dare you compare the QX80 with a Taycan? Well, you just can, you just had, like, two mammals. You know, they, they're basically the same. So I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> but Audi, I mean, speaking of Audi, I mean, last year they, they came out and say, you know, we're so far behind Tesla. He, they admitted it. The the, yeah. the the CEO was like, we're just so far behind. They're at least two years ahead in terms of EV technology. I think that is pretty evident even with the Taycan Um but that's not not the end of the story when you're buying a premium electric vehicle. You know, yeah. it's not all about range and power and all that. It's just you want it to be a nice enough car. And obviously you're getting an Audi with Audi fit and finish. That side angle just now looked a little bit strange. I think that the brake lights are <laughs> a little bit too big. They kind of look like the kicks. <laughs> it kind of looked like the kicks we just had the the porsche rear i think is a better better yeah the porsche rear and it's that single light that goes across the, the entire width i'm a you sucker know, for that so I you know what it. would sell you on the taycan is a sport turismo <laughs> oh ooh. Ooh, yeah <laughs> on that front end, if you gave it the sport turismo rear and there's the lines uh, I think you would. it's got a random hood bulge, like for Pete's sake, the hood bulge and the massive grills, massive air intakes, brake cooling. Like it's, it's a little bit strange. It's on, an RS product. It needs the grills. <sighs> e-tron GT is what this thing is called. E-tron RS, Audi RS e-tron. You can't get it as a non RS, I guess. You can. So there's two models. There is the e-tron GT and then it's the RS e-tron GT. So the base e-tron starts at 99,000, um, 99,900 American, uh, on the front motor, that's 235 horsepower rear motor, 429 total. That's 469 at 465 pound feet of torque launch control. You can have like an over boost function for two and a half seconds. That brings up to 523 horsepower. So zero to 60, that's under four seconds, like 3.9 with a top speed of 152. If you get the RS, you get a stronger rear motor, which means you get a 637 horsepower when you use that launch control. Uh, mm -hmm. And that gives you 3.1 second zero to 60, which is faster than the R8 V10 performance. Well, and electric cars are always going to destroy anything else in a straight line. But yeah, yeah, the RS it goes up to model, only 155. <laughs> yeah, 155 miles, 155 miles. Uh, yeah. So all of three miles per hour faster than the regular e-tron. I want to know this: uh, what kind of range you're getting at 155, though? <laughs> if I'm cruising down the autobahn, I want to know how long I can do that for. Let me let me reach out to Audi. Um, and I'll arrange uh, a press RS e-tron GT, and we'll uh, we'll go give it a shot. Okay, I think yeah, that is a legitimate test that we need to know. I I'm not in love with this rear end, to be honest. It looks backwards. It looks uh, the way the lines resolve. It looks like if you if you made those brake lights white, like that would be the front end. <laughs> <laughs> I think. It because of the roof line, it looks too much like a 911 to me. Mm -hmm. 
because I mean, it's designed as a Taycan first. It's designed to be a Porsche product. Um, because of that, I just it looks like a 911 the rather big than difference like is an Audi. The way the Taycan resolves the rear, they have that crossbar tail light. Let's pull up a Taycan so we can see it on our YouTube. The it just raises where that you have to see the rear. Uh, it just raises where that uh, that coupe line ends, and yeah. it just looks a little bit more natural. It doesn't doesn't look like it's drooping down or melting in to the rear bumper as much as the uh, as much as the Audi. I think yeah, yeah. That that little styling quirk is why I prefer the Porsche. Something that I did find that was kind of cool is, um, as you know, most electric vehicles the batteries are on the floor. Um, but I'll see if I can find a photo of it. Um, because of the roof line, of course, it cuts in a lot to that rear headroom. Um, the RS e-tron, I don't know if it's the same in the Taycan. I would have believe it's the same. But the, oh, it has to be. Yeah, the battery has actually cut out underneath the rear passenger footwell or at the passenger footwell on the back. So that way, you there can actually have a place for your foot. So this picture right here. So this is a cutout. So when you're sitting here on the back seat, you actually have foot space. Because nice. I'm sure you sat in the Tesla Model S. The back seat, when you sit inside, you're like, hmm. You kind of thought it had more leg room. Yeah, seat's a little bit high. Or the floor is a little bit high. The floor is high because of the battery itself. And this, there's a cutout there. I mean, at... Like with the cutout, of course, you're getting a smaller battery, but you're getting foot room in the rear. Is that a good trade off? I think they had to, considering like the roof line, how much yeah. that cuts in. If they didn't do that, it's you would not need to be used as a four door longer rear seat. And then that you, you can't do that coupe roof line anymore. Yeah, I think it's going to be like a two plus two kind of thing. We can kind of see the battery cut out a little bit better here. Yeah, that is a nice, nice chassis. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what I'm looking at, but that that looks <laughs> really well put together. Yeah, it's the German, so kind of has Here's to be, doesn't it? Great. <laughs> yeah, those motors are huge, though. Yeah, definitely it eats into the the trunk space a little bit. I don't know. For me, if I'm spending this kind of money, I I'm still in a Panamera Sport Turismo. Or an RS6 or an RS7. Yeah, but what if you need an electric? If I have 120, 30 grand to blow, I don't need an electric. I'm not worried about my <laughs> gas bill. It's no, it's not about that. It's about your image. You know, you gotta make sure that you're saving the environment. You have you to buy to tell electric. everyone. Yeah. But they've gone and, and made this not look like a electric car by giving it a massive a bunch grill. of grills. And uh, the interior is probably where these two cars differentiate more. Um, the Taycan's got the dual sc triple screen, actually. Yeah. Oh, Optional in some models to have the passenger side screen. Yeah. Um, but it's all it's all touch, kind of like the Tesla. Yeah. Uh, the Audi, we've got some hard buttons, and I don't think it's enough hard buttons. You're still mostly using the touch screen for it. Yeah, but it is kind of typical of this segment yeah. and um it's a more conventional interior i think on this car pretty nice interior though but yeah yeah i'm not i'm not a big fan of how audi does this kind of teardrop thing with their with their headlight that picture will show it just to the left there i think you know the way the headlight just melts downwards and looks like it's 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 crying a little bit um it is kind of aggressive, but it's not like elegant. Hmm. And I think when they first launched this generation Audi R8, that's where that one really didn't work for me. It was the 2016 R8, I want to say. And uh, just doesn't look as elegant as the outgoing model or especially the la like that third picture. It just, it's just way too much grill below the, the headlight hmm. it's just blocky and just doesn't look doesn't look happy doesn't look look sexy i don't even know what they're they're really doing there um 
that's why the Lamborghini is a better product. But you're getting a Lamborghini vehicle for a lot less money. Yeah, I wonder if they're going to have a Lambo variant of this electric car. I'm sure it's in the works because why wouldn't they? They need to push the company forward. That's kind of where they want to be. Yeah, that actually makes complete sense. I mean, yeah, I, I can see it. I can definitely see it. I mean, they took the R8 and made a, an SUV. Why not take the the electrification of the e-tron GT and put it in the next yeah. box? I do remember they did make a concept car for Lambo for some kind of EV, but um, nothing, nothing really in the works. Nothing confirmed, at least. Mm -hmm. The the Eurus is available as a PHEV. Is it? I believe so. I I haven't even looked into. That. I don't know how much a Eurus is. I don't know what what drivetrains they have, but um, it's it's very out of my price range, so I don't pay yeah. too much attention to it. <laughs> and then you don't even get what we were just talking about, which is that that image. It's like you look like you're driving a ridiculous planet killing suv and you made it an electric vehicle or a plug-in hybrid <laughs> this doesn't doesn't rub me the right because you're not really saving any money or you don't care about saving money and then uh yeah plug-in hybrid is a necessary compromise <laughs> it's the most <laughs> ridiculous car and it's like giving it a plug-in hybrid is not uh i'm sure yeah i'm sure there's some sort of like kickback that they got when they created this it's probably some like cafe standard whatever that you have to have x many you have to have electrification in your range to yeah. keep selling cars but uh, i don't think that's a real ev product but yeah it would be cool to see a little bit upscale with the lamborghini taycan e-tron gt But yeah, that, that tail light does look like a Nissan to me. <laughs> Every time the the little swoosh or yeah, not the kink. It's uh, mm. a little bit. Yeah, I think some Korean products have it, but definitely, literally, even the kicks they went the kicks that we just showed had that same crossbar with <laughs> little. Yeah, Justin, I just think you have uh, the kicks on your mind a little too much there. I do, and I like to make these ridiculous connections between cars that have nothing alike like the ssc, like Totara SSC and, to the volvo, and the truck. volvo tr uh, semi truck <laughs> um yeah it does look curvy though it, it's nice i mean i think it's an elegant car um next to a taycan the taycan will look better and you know it's the taycan's going to be something that's going to be more expensive and it's going to look more expensive um but i think for an Audi product, this is a great alternative mm -hmm. to get Taycan levels in Audi pricing. I mean, I'm not saying Audi is cheap. This is a hundred thousand dollars. This is not cheap by any means, but I there mean, is Taycan a is big price, a jump. lot more than that. <laughs> yeah, especially when you load it up. Same with the RS6. The RS6 is not cheap, but a Panamera Turbo S is double. So <laughs> that's just to give us some perspective, like the Audi product and the Porsche product, they may look like they start at a similar price, but where you end up is, is nowhere near uh, oh. when you go to Porsche. Yeah. Taycan's only, only a 120K, 120,000 uh, Canadian. For the 4S. Turbo or 4S, yeah. Yeah, the Turbo is 175. So isn't like... Yeah really far off than the e-tron gt mm. hmm. never mind buy the Taycan. yeah let's uh <laughs> wrap up with uh what reviews you put out this week yeah so this week was a little bit special um there was two reviews that dropped there was the mercedes a35 that was a little fancy hot hatch as well as the cx30 turbo um, the CX-30 Turbo embargo lifted yesterday, and that was a, a special kind of push. I think... I think like, Mazda's a little bit ahead of themselves putting an embargo on a car. The CX-30, everyone's reviewed it. The Mazda 3 Turbo, everyone's reviewed it. So yeah. we're not... 
we're not uh, going to be caught off guard by anything with these cars. No, <laughs> it's not. It, it wasn't. But I, I, I understand their embargo. I actually enjoyed my time with the CX-30. I only have like th- two days with the CX-30 Turbo. Mm. Um, but I did take some time off work just to drive it, just to make sure I have you know sufficient amount of time in it. It's a good driving vehicle. And because it's a little bit higher riding, you don't expect that turbo punch as much, mm. um, as much as within the Mazda 3. So when driving it, it's not as fast as a 3, but it's less expected, so it feels a little bit better. Um, the only thing I would say about the CX-30 that I'm personally not a big fan of, it's just the amount of body cladding that there is on the side. It's a little bit too thick like it's it's like six inches tall if you look yeah it's it's a little much much. it's a little much it's the same as a normal cx30 though it is exact same um from the outside the only difference between the turbo motor version and the regular two and a half liter four cylinder is the blacked out wheels blacked out mirrors slightly larger exhaust tips a turbo badge on the back and a turbo badge under the hood and that's it well, and you know, I think your as tested price was what thirty six something something around. Uh, this is yeah thirty six thousand four hundred fifty. Thirty six, and you know the cross track full load is thirty four five. Yeah, but a cross track full that load is, is it can't compete. It's miserable CX-30. to drive. Like the power is so. It's like even with their updated power, it's it struggles. Um, they're not. But I think that's the closest competitor. Well, the that's the thing. Mazda, they're not going towards their they're just doing general their Subaru thing. and Kia and whatnot. They're going higher end. They're trying to fight the GLA, the X1 and the X2, A1, as well A3. as the Q3. Q3, yeah. Yeah, that's what their market is marketing is towards. And like if you look on paper in terms of interior size, power, uh, features, it's very similar. And it's a lot less. I mean, I actually yeah, mentioned thirty-six it in the full load is very reasonable for yeah. Well, this GLA was fifty thousand. Was it fifty thousand? Yeah, and it's not even a full load. No, and then this was fifty-five. That's a little bit full load. That's a little bit excessive. But realistically, the X ones I I see probably are in the mid to high forties range without all the M stuff on it. Well, the M stuff looks good, though. Does it? <laughs> it looks like it's on stilts, like they're trying to force it into a... Uh... It, it's 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 all right. <laughs> I, like actually, the, I like the standard. The standard, standard one is actually a little bit better, but the I, I always like the M Sport packages. Um, I think it's the rear of the X1. I like it a lot more yeah. than the rear. But the front, the body-colored think... plastics... Yeah, like, they do look good. I think the front bumper is not so good, but uh, the one thing I I'm kind of picky about on a CX thirty is that it just it's the same interior as the the three pretty much. It's about the same. There really isn't a difference unless you have them side by side, and the only difference you'll see is um, it's just like the height of some of the items is a little bit different, and that's about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a great car. We've worked on a few of them, and like, just where they spend the money is kind of nice. Like, we take off the headliner, and like the material is super nice. If you take off the headliner in like a Honda, you'll cut your fingers. Like, it's <laughs> like stuff that that like the, the trimming is just better on a Mazda. Um, how do you like that infotainment system? They use it on all their cars. I actually enjoy it a lot more than the old one. It's a lot easier to use. Um, I know the old one, when you're stationary, you can still use a touchscreen. But mm-hmm. I, I mean, how often are you stationary? Really never. So you're using that rotary dial. And when you're using a rotary dial, this one's a lot better. Um, yeah. The shortcuts that's on it, I like this. And it's so simple. There's really only five buttons. The controller itself and the four buttons around it. But okay, it but makes complete sense of how, how you use it. Does that compare to MBUX or MBUX is very complicated. Yeah. Um, all the Mercedes products are very complicated. So, you know, when you drive it, I personally wouldn't recommend people 
to mess around <laughs> with MBUX while driving because of how complicated it is. Yeah, I just had one of my dad's friends, so it's over 60. He texted me. He just picked up a he's the one that's waiting for his RS5, but mm. he picked up in the meantime, he was driving an E not what's the five E53 wagon. And he he just texted me just to say this MBUX is so hard to use. I can't figure out how to put in a Navi. I'm like, just use CarPlay. Like, <laughs> like why why are you why are you fussing with that? Just use CarPlay. That car has it. Like, yeah, that's kind of how I feel too. Is like I don't really nowadays it doesn't matter quite as much um, as far as like overall user friendliness because everyone's got a data plan. Everyone's got CarPlay or Android Auto. As long as they give you both Android and CarPlay, I'm I'm pretty happy with that. Yeah. Uh, A35, that's kind of their 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 lukewarm lukewarm, or would we call it a hot hatch? Uh, I would I would kind of say it's a hot hatch because we don't get the A45, um, but right. in the US they don't even get the A35 hatch. They only get A35 sedan. Yeah, it is hot because if we're gonna call a Golf R a hot hatch, that's a hot hatch. So, yeah, and it sounds um, good. Like it actually sounds good. What was um, the as tested price on that thing? This one as tested is fifty five thousand. Oh, that's actually more reasonable than I thought. <laughs> uh, it this one was actually quite special. It almost had no options on it. Oh, that's <laughs> most why. most Mercedes press cars that we get um, have a lot of options, but this one didn't have any. If you do stack on like all the options, it's like seventy k. Okay. Yeah, yeah that, that's kind of where I thought it would be, like in the <laughs> 60s range. But uh, 55, it's uh, that's compelling. They've got massive brakes on those things. I don't know if you you took Four a pot. close. They're they're physically ridiculous. Um, we do a lot of winter wheel and tire packages, and we had a CLA 35, a new one come in, and the brakes are just like ridiculous on that thing i i i went through three different sets of wheels to find something that actually cleared and in the end we're just like you're you're, you're taking spacers because nothing will clear your brake they're way too big um so we, we put on some 18s with a spacer on them it's like i'm like yeah i'm not i'm not ordering you any more wheels manufacturers said they would fit at like you compare the brakes on that compared to like what's on a golf r or um what kind of competes with this the uh the BMW, the BMW now BMW their doesn't brakes, have a hatch though. They don't, but they have their the the M two three five really unattractive, and I don't know why it even exists. The two thirty five just really does the two series name dirty. <laughs> <laughs> As a person think, that owns an M two, you hate it. Yeah, I think I think all the traditional BMW people hate that car. I do have one customer that went from the old 235 or 240 to that. And I'm like, I, I just wanted to know like why. And he's like, like he couldn't really give me a good reason why this list, this is better. He's <laughs> like, oh, it's more practical. I'm like, well, sure. It's not a two door coupe, but yeah, it's barely, barely better. But you have to get premium package. Yeah. Well, I mean, if not, you don't get keyless go. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how because the kicks I think comes with keyless go. Yeah, <laughs> standard. Uh, yeah, Nissan's my, been always been good with including that as standard. I think mine was packaged like this with premium package and nav. Yeah, nav is is not useful. I don't think you need the nav. Um, so that's for not low, the biggest thing, but what I do like is the tech pack. So it comes with. Uh, the tech pack, you have to get the premium package on top, but the LED headlamps, it comes with standard LED headlamps, but the multi-beam that's on the tech package, it's a lot better. It comes with adaptive as well. Um, in other parts in the world, it does the whole multi Does it look like that thing? RAV4 reflector LED thing? The base one kind of looks like that. It changes a little bit. You can kind of see in this image here. Yeah. And then that okay that looks the same <laughs> I, I saw a change but yeah just barely uh aerodynamics package that's the one that everyone was uh all the press photos had this package it's just so stupid <laughs> the, 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 spoiler is, front. the spoiler is actually not bad the canards are a little bit ridiculous i i can't i no i'm not a fan of the spoiler i don't think it needs it it comes with a little lip spoiler that's really nice on it already it 
doesn't need the additional nice. package that's on this it. this was actually the spec that my dad was going to order with the yellow with the uh, amg a35 but then my mom test drove it and she's like it's way too uncomfortable it is very uncomfortable um yeah. but but did you get the uh did you test drive the one with the adaptive suspension the amg oh, driver's gosh. pack think this is the one i imagine their demo cars usually have uh have the yeah that one has some kind of suspension to it but yeah it's a it's a nice car i mean i think if you don't want to yeah three stage yeah, ride control was three stage those yeah. those yeah the the press car that i had did not have the amg ride control um i haven't tested it i don't know if it's actually a lot softer but driving around the amg like it was it feels like a mini nah the mini because of the shorter wheelbase especially on like the regular coopers um i think that was worse uh -huh. than this but it was it wasn't comfortable driving around in it okay because personally i'm okay with a mini even with the jcws i think it's it's bouncy but it's i guess the chassis is so solid that it just feels okay like the damping is is there right um and i hope the a35 is the same way um you know for for a guy like me i think it's i don't i'm not too concerned about ride comfort but uh yeah for someone like me that was in a car accident not that long ago and my back is still broken yeah the a35 was not comfortable <laughs> yeah any other gripes about it that you don't want to share in the video but you want to put in this podcast <laughs> mercedes canada is not listening probably not but to be honest not really that was it um driving around normal mode it doesn't make enough noise in sport plus mode it makes a lot of noise uh, maybe a little too much draws a lot of attention uh which it crackles I, it, it does a crackle it does all that i actually just drove it around normal and most times just to reduce the attention that i was uh i was getting even though it's a black hatchback there's four relatively large exhaust tips out back i just didn't want to draw that kind of attention mm -hmm. if i didn't have to so uh, just wanted to ask, just because you've test drove all of this A series, I guess, with the A, the CLA, GLA, GLB, uh, which one would you get and mm. why? I think out of all the A classes, the uh, regular A250 hatch, the A220 sedan, the A35 hatch the cla220 as well as the cla45 mm -hmm. the 45 was bonkers just how fast it was and what it provided um but i don't think that's like my car if i was to pick i'll probably pick the a35 with the adaptive suspension if it's comfortable enough right because i i like hatches i mean it's more practical and i love how the rear end of this looks um some say it looks like a Forte. If it's you remember, a little the, bit small, yeah. If you remember the Forte, I totally before, remember what the Forte, Forte was. rear, um, Forte five. Yeah, Forte yeah. five. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It yeah. looks like that size of car. I think with this generation, the CLA is like way better looking than the old one. The CLA is really good compared to before, but yeah, I. The, it's just so impractical, I guess. That's the thing. Getting into the back seat, and once again, because I am a because father, you have a child seat. It doesn't make sense to put anything in the no, back because the the roof line, how it slopes down, is not the roof line only. It's the window line that slopes down quite a bit, mm -hmm. and because of that, getting in and out of those rear seats is not comfortable. Right. Yeah. I I think the CLA. Yeah. I'm. I, I do like that car. Uh, I've always been a hatch guy at this. And then there's the upcoming Golf R Mark 8. The Golf R should be quite interesting. Yeah, I'm curious how these two cars uh, stack up. Um, the Volkswagen, I mean, the Mark 8, we've seen a lot of the Mark 8 already. Um, the a, I, I do like this new Mercedes interior. I know you might think the, the Mazda product is just as good if not better but there is something about 
the design that's just like so much more interesting to me and just speaks to me uh maybe not in terms of you know hard plastics and whatever but i i think the maz or not the maz the mercedes interior is just quite compelling it looks good materials down under um it's not that great and as you can see me trying to get out of the cla not easy <laughs> not elegant no no i think the interior it's fine um there are definitely nice pieces that's on here but those seats are really nice too the, the seats are super aggressive yeah. on the cla 45 yeah absolutely um i i honestly don't mind the interior but i think because it is the a class they cheapen out on some of the materials lower down it just doesn't feel that great and if you get into a Mercedes, like just start shifting things around, like like do the Matt Watson test. You know how he puts his hand on the and then you just start to move things. It creaks and it moves and it's just not built. It doesn't feel like it's built like old Mercedes of the past. It's not like a tank, <laughs> essentially. No, but there's there's so much. Uh to like about it i think this generation we're finally seeing like kind of more nimble more sporty cars in north america from mercedes i think traditionally they've been so kind of bulbous and clumsy yeah uh even in their respective class uh against bmw and to some extent audi too uh, audi was making kind of sporty or sharper cars than this and to see Mercedes step it up in terms of the handling and fun to drive factor, I think that's a, that's a nice move. The brakes work really well. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> do they all have the panoramic roof? Um, yeah, they all do. Um, yeah. They do open. They open pretty wide. Glass pops out on the outside. Um, I don't know if it's optional, though. I don't recall that part. Not sure like about this. that. Yeah. Yeah. The GLB is like, that's like the value buy, but it's like the old B class where it's, it's kind of uglier than the rest of them. And it's just, it just, it makes so much sense on paper, but it's just, you know, it just doesn't look as good. No, it doesn't. Um, doesn't. But yeah, the, the A, the GLA and the CLA all look really handsome. Uh, that GLB is just, <laughs> has a bit of that QX80 look just to bring things back a bit. <laughs> has that like really like deer in the headlights, like that, that gray one, even with all the AMG goodies on it. It just looks like it's just a box, like a toaster. Like, yeah, it's supposed to bring kind of like that G Wagon look. <laughs> I, I've I've sat in I've driven a GLB and I actually really like it because of just the amount of space that it provided yeah. compared to the GLA. Um, it's super practical. Um, I haven't tested the third row in the GLB. I don't expect it to be good. I mean, it is a compact SUV after mm -hmm. all, but I I actually didn't mind it. And my wife, yeah. when she drove it, she actually liked the GLB. She was like, oh, it's actually very nippy. It's and so good. Because it drives like those sexier cars. Yeah, but regular it has the practicality the and a bigger trunk than even the GLC, I believe. was. Yeah, was it's it's bigger than the GLC because of just the boxiness just of it. Being so upright and, and front-wheel drive base and stuff like that. <laughs> That angle looks okay. Actually, it looks a little bit like a mini GLS. Yeah, it 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 has that. Yeah, it has that mini shrunken down look. That it's it's quirky, but it's not pretty like the rest of them. <laughs> well, as someone that loves a pacement, I don't know if I can take your uh your words on visuals. Oh, how dare you! <laughs> Well, I guess other really, news. No, I think that's it. At the, I think that wraps it up for what we got for today. Yeah, all Nissan episode. Well, mostly Nissan episode. Mostly it Nissan ties episode. back to everything is is Nissan and Infinity at some point. And <laughs> yeah, well, in any case, thank you so much for watching, everyone. Um, of course, we're gonna do this every week. It's gonna be on YouTube, Spotify, podcast, wherever you get your podcast from. And we'll catch you next time.